Spoilers for Turning Red. Content note, this video contains mentions and discussions of puberty. So if you've been online and have seen the discourse around Turning Red before it came out, you know that it wasn't great. But even after it premiered, the reviews on Rotten Tomatoes by audiences were okay at best and really, really, really bad at worst. The audience score does seem to be rising as the movie gets reviewed by more and more people, and honestly, I don't really know anyone who takes Rotten Tomato scores that seriously or even knows how to really understand them in the grand scheme of things. I originally wasn't going to make a video on this film because I just really liked it, but I realized that I have a lot of things to say about why I like it, so that's what this video is going to be about. Why I liked it, and why I thought the themes it presented were important and well executed. Normally, I don't watch movies as soon as they come out. I think this came from a habit that I built up as a kid and teen who just didn't go to the movies that often because A, we couldn't afford it, and B, when we did have the money to go to the movies, we would see movies that my parent chose. So because of that, I was always really late to movies until they came out on TV or until I got a DVD for Christmas. And that just became the norm of how I digested films. I would always see them three months after they came out. And even as an adult with a disposable income, I still didn't go to the theater that much. I'm talking about pre-plague, by the way. Unless it was a movie that I really needed to see, and even then sometimes I wouldn't go. I also think I realized as I grew up and went to the movies more that I really just hate the movie theater experience. And at this point, you're either nodding along in agreement with me or completely alienated by what I just said. But let me explain. I really hate being overstimulated and try to avoid that as much as possible, so therefore big screens and loudspeakers aren't my idea of fun. I also hate how during the previews there's always a horror movie that just scares the daylight out of me. I also live in an area where you have to reserve seats before you go to the movies, again this was pre-plague, so when I did go to the theaters I would get so anxious about picking the seats that I couldn't even just enjoy the excitement of, I'm going to see a movie. Lastly, I really dislike watching movies with a bunch of strangers. One of the last movies I saw in theaters was The Greatest Showman. The last movie I saw in theaters, by the way, was Emma, right before the play hit. But anyway, I was watching The Greatest Showman, and not once, but twice, the person behind me answered their phone and went into a full conversation with the person on the other end. Not only that, but you have people kicking your seat, other people scrolling on their phone or taking stories of the movie, and I don't know, that behavior just irks the shit out of me. I really hate inconsiderate people, and not even inconsiderate people, but just people who are oblivious to their surroundings, and for some reason, those people tend to converge in movie theaters and other tightly enclosed spaces like airplanes. So as someone who doesn't like to be overstimulated and hates being around strangers, and who also loves the ability to pause a movie and put on subtitles, having movies be released on streaming is one of the best things ever. And it's honestly sad that it took a global pandemic to make movies more accessible, when they could have been this accessible all along. I've been able to watch so many movies that I normally wouldn't have seen for months until after their release. Not only that, but I can watch them in my own home as many times as I want to. Like, isn't that the ultimate movie going experience? This is all to say that I was able to watch a lot of movies as soon as they came out these past two years, rather than having to wait. However, I still really like waiting until the hype dies down around a movie to eventually watch it and sort out my thoughts. But with Turning Red, I just knew that I had to watch it as soon as it came out. And thankfully I was able to, and in the end, like I already stated, I really liked it. So now that you have all that background information, let's get started. In this video, I'm not going to read the hate-fueled reviews and tweets against Turning Red, because honestly, I just can't even give those takes the time of day, but I still do want to talk about the art style, why it upset people, and what I think about it personally. So when the promotional material for this film came out, a lot of people said this was the end of Pixar. This along with Luca were in a lot of viral tweets about how Pixar isn't what it used to be. And this mainly has to do with Luca and more specifically Turning Red's character designs. They weren't as sophisticated, I guess, or as pleasing to look at compared to other Pixar movie designs, which honestly makes no sense to me, but okay. The designs of the main characters of Turning Red look a lot more like 3D CGI Steven Universe characters than the usual Disney and Pixar big-eyed female characters with feminine frames. Those ranging from being curvy if they're a middle-aged woman who's also a mom, to just thin, the default female character design in most cases regardless of age or personality. In contrast, Mae and her friends are bulky, round, and therefore seen as unfeminine, ugly, and not pleasing to look at. And this is really annoying to me because they're like 13, why do they need to be pleasing to look at? They're children, they're also cartoon characters, and cartoon characters can look goofy and silly, that's one of the fun parts of the medium. 
but because they're specifically female characters, the idea that we can play and exaggerate with what they look like gets thrown out the window. So now let's talk a little bit about character designing. Character designs at Disney and Pixar for all genders usually are made to reflect the personality of a character. If a character is evil, for example, they might tend to look non-white, fat, flamboyant, and just not nice looking. And this makes sense on a surface level. Evil people look evil is good movie shorthand. But this can take a really bad turn with what it implies about people who might deviate from the acceptable norm. For example, in Ratatouille, the evil guy, Chef Skinner, is short, has a darker complexion than the rest of the cast, isn't typically masculine, etc. So we know that this guy is evil. You could make the argument that Anton Ego is a villain too, but he's more of an anti-hero who eventually gets fleshed out, and he has the most poignant dialogue in the entire film, whereas Chef Skinner is just evil through and through. And this is a pattern that has been well established in Disney's animation for a while, but I think only recently has been explored in Pixar movies, mainly because Pixar movies usually don't have human protagonists. In turn, the good characters are usually the whitest looking people possible, who are also not fat, not flamboyant, and are just clumsy, good-natured self-insert characters for the audience to identify with. So when designing characters for a long time in animation, the bad guys were coded with deviant societal traits in the real world, and the good guys were coded with positive and normative traits celebrated in society. And this is why you can't really separate the art from the outside world because we influence art as much as it influences us. And then you have to add gender into the mix. Where the men usually get a wider range of body types that say something about their unique personality, a lot of female character designs are usually just girl, and sometimes that means being the girl version of the male hero and love interest. The female characters at Disney and Pixar and in the wider world of contemporary animation tend to just have one body type, thin with a big head and big eyes. They tend to just look like babies, and this isn't to say that this kind of character design shouldn't exist. I love the big-eyed female protagonist, but just that A, it's getting kind of old, and B, it doesn't give female characters that much range to be anything other than thin, wide-eyed, and upholding societal expectations for female bodies. I think the most egregious example of this is Anna and Elsa's mom, Iduna, who yes, died young, but assuming she's a bit older than her kids, they have the same face. She literally has a baby's face. I do have to say that the Pixar girls at least don't fall into this trap as much as the Disney girls, and they have a somewhat better range and their faces aren't as babyish. But as for the Disney girls and a lot of female characters in animation in general, they tend not to get to have as fun of a character design that says something about their personality other than, I'm a girl. And this isn't to say that work doesn't go into the female character designs and specific choices aren't made. For example, Merida's hair is a big part of her design because she's free-spirited and uncontainable. But just that the male suitors in the film and the men in general get to have more range because they're men, and therefore the designers and artists aren't pressured to always make them aesthetically pleasing to the eye. They get to be old, bald, scrawny, big, etc. Whereas the girls and women must always have the same body type of just thin woman, and maybe we'll throw a cool hairstyle in there. But to be fair, the male protagonists also usually don't look that different from how we imagine good or handsome men are in the real world because they're supposed to be the self-insert character, and that's kind of sad too. For a long time, the characters with the most interesting character designs were the villains. Because they didn't have to uplift physical or moral values in society, they can be deviant and look deviant. They can be fat, old, they can have big noses, narrow faces, high cheekbones, etc. And in the end, that's what real people look like. We're all unique with unique features that make us who we are. Most people aren't your typical YA self-insert looking protagonist, and that's okay. Honestly, can you imagine the Frozen we could have had if they kept Elsa as a villain? Like, look at this concept art. But it's important to note that female characters specifically haven't been given a lot to work with because for a long time designing female characters meant having to please the men in the room and their appearances were put first before their design that's supposed to express something about their personality and further the story, but usually doesn't. I mean, what can you tell me about Elsa versus what can you tell me about Stoic? The head of animation on Frozen recently was quoted saying that, Historically speaking, animating female characters is really, really difficult because they have to go through these ranges of emotions, but you have to keep them pretty, and they're very sensitive too. You can get them off mold very quickly. 
And though Frozen is a Disney production and not a Pixar production, I think it's safe to assume that they operate on the same guidelines when designing female characters. Keep them pretty and appearances matter more than if their character design helps tell the story. However, this is changing, thankfully, at both studios. As we've seen with Encanto, the older women get to be old, and this doesn't just mean that they're more curvy or given the curvy mom treatment, but that they get to have gray hair and wrinkles and frown lines. The main character, Mirabelle, gets to look angry, and her expressions are pushed to just as much as the male characters, because guess what? Female characters in animation don't exist to look pretty, and they shouldn't be valued for their appearance, but for who they are. And I think it's great that that message is being pushed. The Frozen animation head, though as unabashed as they were, did bring up a good point, whether knowingly or unknowingly, and that is that female characters in animation aren't allowed to be designed in ways that don't keep them pretty, nor are they allowed to move in ways that don't keep them pretty. And though he was stating that the problem is that they have to stay pretty and that's hard, he was indirectly pointing out that yeah, this is a problem, even though he doesn't really care about fixing it. And going back to Turning Red, this film doesn't adhere to the conventional idea that female characters need to be designed to be physically pleasing, nor do they have to have their movements restricted to uplift the status quo, instead they can just be. They can be as expressive and wild-eyed as male characters. They can be designed to be chunky and round, and not to have the typical bobblehead dimensions as their Disney peers. And you have no idea how refreshing it is to see cartoon kids looking like cartoon kids who don't have to be thin, who can look deviant to society's standards, and still be celebrated. Do I personally like the character designs? I like them in that they're different, but I think my favorite character design style and animation style to come out recently is the style of Arcane. I have to be honest and say that I love the big high baby face style, but I also get that that style doesn't work with every story. I also get why Turning Red didn't utilize that style for their story, and I admire them for taking that leap and doing something different. In all, I think the style fits perfectly for the story they're telling, and it isn't distracting in the least. One of the first themes of the movie is of course the Asian diaspora, and more specifically the Chinese Canadian immigrant experience. I'm adopted from China and from the US, so I can't speak to the accuracy of the narrative, but I do know from what I've read that the movie really has spoken to a lot of people. Not to mention, Dami Shi, the director, is a daughter of Chinese Canadian immigrants, though she's of the second generation like Ming, rather than from the third generation that Mei is part of. However, as an Asian American kid who grew up in the early 2000s and had to buy my own Tamagotchi, played the flute, drew anime, who was obsessed with various boy bands, went to Chinese school, and had a dorky group of other Asian friends, I found the movie really relatable and just awesome to see. I really love how the story wasn't a struggle between a first generation parent and a second generation child, but a second generation child and a third generation child, because I feel like that story isn't highlighted as much. Ming knows what it's like having all the dreams of her parents pinned on her, just like Mei knows that feeling, and I think that's really important, and why Ming can say sorry and understand Mei more than, let's say, Mei's grandmother, though the grandmother still lets Mei keep the panda, even if she might not approve. I think Ming strikes that perfect balance of wanting to be a Canadian parent versus still internalizing her mother's own messages to her as a kid of making sure Mei knows her place. And it's nice at the end seeing Ming grow and learning to see Mei, as she puts it. I think in general it's easy to forget as a parent to put yourself in your kid's shoes and for first generation immigrants and their second generation children it's impossible because of where and when they grew up. And that experience is specifically unique to Ming and her mother, but again, because Mei and Ming share more in common, it's easier for Ming to see herself in Mei's shoes once she's able to find the power to do so. And though a lot of the story is very specific to a certain experience, I think the story is also very universal, not just applying to Chinese Canadian immigrant mother and daughter experiences, but to the larger parent and child dynamic. Most children at some point or another feel the need to assert themselves to their parents. Mei needs to assert her identity and personhood, that she's not just her mother's daughter, but her own person, and that her mom needs to accept that. I definitely have had moments where my mom would blame others for how I was acting, say bad things about my friends or the media I consumed, and would put the fault on everyone but herself or even me for how I was acting. Some parents don't think their child is capable of independent thought or have their own ideas or act on their own accord, and that is really dangerous. And even worse still, some parents don't realize their children act out because of them. And I love how that's resolved by the end of the movie, with Ming and Mei having a true conversation where Ming has to realize that she's the reason why Mei has been acting out, and says sorry. I love when she says, the farther you go, the prouder I'll be. 
meaning to me, the more different from me you become, the happier I'll be because you won't repeat the cycle of intergenerational trauma, where you won't feel like you have to be perfect to be loved. And that's such an important lesson for kids, but also more specifically to the children of immigrants who know that their parents have this idea of them that they must live up to. And if they can't, they might lose that love and that's really scary. Turning Red tells us that a solid child-parent relationship isn't only built on love, but respect and trust, two factors that get greatly overlooked. If that respect and trust isn't there on both sides, how could your child ever learn to respect you? Short story is, they won't. They'll lie, they'll grow distant, they'll lash out, just like May. Another theme in the movie is, of course, puberty, and more specifically, tween girl puberty. Though it's important to note that anyone of any gender can get a period, have crushes on boys, etc. In the film, we see that May turning into a red panda is a fun metaphor for puberty. She's gaining weight, getting bigger, smells bad, has hair everywhere, and is literally red. I love how the title is called Turning Red, like red for period blood. May is also going through a sort of sexual awakening, realizing that she likes boys, she likes drawing sexy things that make her feel excited, and she's just starting to explore those feelings. And it's so nice to see that that is part of growing up, rather than something you should be ashamed of. I remember as a kid, I was around 11, I would draw sexy anime characters either from my own head or from anime I watched, and the sexiness would literally just be a line above the shirt indicating cleavage on a female character. And I was sketching one day and a family friend was like, what's that? And started laughing at it and it made me never want to draw in public ever again. May and her friends are also really into a boy band called Four Town. And I just really love the name, by the way, because there's this running joke about how four is a bad number because in China, it sounds like the word for death. And it's just that extra detail in there that makes you know the people behind this movie really care about the culture they're trying to represent, but can also have fun with it. And I, like May, was also really obsessed with boy bands, mainly the Jonas Brothers in middle school. I had their posters all over my walls, I had all their CDs, and they were my cell phone wallpaper. But unlike May, a lot of my so-called friends made fun of me for it. And it's like, I'm 12, we're 12. I feel like even back then, kids were growing up too fast. Like, sorry I'm watching Camp Rock and not MTV. And I was in that weird stage of trying to watch older content, but still preferring Nick and Disney and thinking, wow, I'm such a loser. But now as an adult, it's like I was 12. What business did I have watching my super sweet 16 and E! True Hollywood stories? I did have other friends who didn't mock me for being obsessed with boy bands and who I could geek out with and watch anime with and draw with. But I did, unlike May, always feel like even more of a loser because I wasn't growing up fast enough. And that always kind of sucked. This is all to say that I really loved when May shouted at her mom, I'm 13, deal with it. I remember saying that a lot to my own parent at different ages of like, I'm 12, I'm 16, what do you want me to do? I think as you get older, your parents expect you to start acting like an adult. But a lot of this comes too early because again, you're 13. But at the same time, you want more responsibility or at least want to be taken more seriously but then you can't because you're just a kid. Being a teenager is hard because you are still a kid, but you're also becoming an adult and dealing with parental expectations of who they want you to be versus who you are adds even more stress. And I'm glad we're getting art that reflects that. The last theme I want to talk about kind of connects to the previous one, and that is the theme of this story is aimed at girls and therefore it isn't for everyone. A lot of times, girls' stories aren't seen as universal because they're about girls, whereas stories about men and boys are for everyone. Turning Red was getting a lot of pushback for being for a very specific type of viewer and not relatable or not for everyone. And honestly, screw that. A lot of the story, like I mentioned, is very universal, specifically with the parenting issues, but also with just growing up and not having the freedom and support you want. There's also the theme of feeling like an outsider or feeling like you don't belong or needing to embrace the messy side of you and to feel those feelings and then grow from them and be proud of them and not push them away. That's fairly relatable, right? And so what if the story isn't universal? 
Who cares? Should we only be telling stories that most people can relate to? What kind of utilitarian storytelling hell is that? I specifically love the memes responding to criticism like this that highlight cars and a story about a rat that were so universal, but Turning Red, a film about a real tween girl living in Canada is just something so alien that it just shouldn't exist, I guess. I think there's also a specific disdain for women's stories because they're seen as low stakes and just domestic tales no one cares about, unlike stories about men and their fast cars and guns where the stakes are life and death. And this isn't to say that women's stories are inherently low stakes, but rather that's the preconceived notion patriarchal society has about them. And Turning Red has big action scenes too. So like, violence happens if that's what draws you into movies. Stories about tween and teen girls are seen as boring because no one dies, nothing gets blown up. And what, they're really gonna talk about periods? Gross? Who cares if they can't go to a concert? What's the big deal? This kind of stuff makes me want to quote that one scene from the Virgin Suicides adaptation by Sofia Coppola, where one of the sisters says, Obviously doctor, you've never been a 13 year old girl. The lives and stories of girls matter just as much as stories about boys becoming men. And they're just as relatable. And again, even if they're not, who cares? And maybe life for teen girls isn't high stakes. But when you're a kid, it feels that way. When they're crying about not being able to go to the concert, I felt that. And if anything, low stakes stories are usually more relatable to wider audiences because most people aren't soldiers, drug dealers, or race car drivers. But most people remember what it was like being 13. I don't really have a conclusion for this video other than I really like turning red, and if you can, you should go watch it. I also did the background art for this video, so I hope you liked it. Let me know what you thought of the movie and this video down below, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.